Hi team, welcome back. My name is Clint Hoagland and this is Creating Electronic Music with Chuck. In our last video, we discussed Chuck's Lisa Eugen, which allows us to do live sampling in real time. In this video, we're gonna learn about events. I'm gonna start with an analogy. Remember back before COVID, when we could go out to eat in restaurants, restaurants like Outback Steakhouse? Well, when you go to Outback and ask for a table, they hand you a little beeper. Then you wait around for the beeper to go off. When the beeper goes off, that means it's time for you to go to your table. Events are software's version of those little beepers at a restaurant. They provide us with a way to hand a signal to a piece of code and a means to wait for that signal. It works like this. You hand a piece of code, usually a child shred, a special object called an event. The code that takes in the event is called an event listener. In our steakhouse analogy, the customer that takes a beeper is an event listener. Two crucial facts about this setup. One is that the person handing the beeper to a customer has no idea what they intend to do with it. They can send a signal to the customer, the event listener, that their event has happened and that their table is ready, but they don't control the customer or what they do with that information. The second is that the restaurant can hand out the same beeper ID to any number of customers, so if they want to, they could notify multiple customers at the same time about the same table. So how does this work from the customer's perspective? What do you do inside the code of an event listener to react to an event? It's actually really simple. You just wait for the event to happen. And in Chuck, the way you wait for an event is to chuck that event into now. Here's an example. I've created a little function that plays through an array of notes inside an infinite loop. However, after it plays the array, I've chucked an event I've named wait into now. If I play it, it gets to that point and waits forever. It will never complete this loop and it will never go back and play the array again. Now let's drop down into this while loop here and call the events signal function. Now, it's going to play the array every two seconds. Note that I am not calling the function every two seconds. The function got called once, and now it's waiting around for the event to happen, and any time it does, it would let it pass this moment so that it can proceed with its while loop. This pattern, where I've got an infinite loop that stops and awaits an event, is called an event loop, and it's a common pattern in programming. Why? We'll get to that in a little bit. Before that, I want to showcase an interesting feature of events in Chuck. I'm going to spork my function two more times, and for each of those, I'm going to go up an octave so you can hear the difference. Now, before I launch this again, I want you to predict what you think is about to happen. Let's try it. The event listeners get launched at the same time, which is here where we spork them, and then they get launched one at a time. This is because Chuck events have two ways they can contact event listeners. If you use their signal function, then the signal contacts the events listeners one at a time on a first come, first serve basis. This fits the steakhouse analogy eerily well. The first customer to get a beeper gets seated first, then the next one, and so on. But we also said that the steakhouse has the ability to contact all the customers at once, and in Chuck, you can do that too. If you use the function broadcast instead of signal, then that notifies all of that event's listeners at once. Okay, so why is this useful? We already had the ability to call functions whenever we wanted, so why would we call them an alternate way? The reason is that events are meant to be a base class that can be extended. Here, I've made a subclass of event called wait with position. In it, I just defined a position property. That enabled me to eliminate the position parameter from my play arp function. Now I can just access the position inside the wait event. I've changed this around a little bit so that it chucks a position into the wait event, sporks the arp using the wait event, and then advances two seconds. Then it goes into the while loop and triggers the event. If we run this, We can see that each child shred was able to get its position from the wait object when it was called, but then when it hit the while loop, all of the child shreds had an event with the same position. Remember, we're not calling these child shreds again. They're all on their own infinite loop awaiting the event signal. This means that subclasses of events can be used to share state between shreds. This is another method of sharing state in addition to using static variables inside public classes. So you can use events to make a child shred wait for something, and you can use events to update shreds that are already running. But we still haven't mentioned the most important aspect of events. Events are the mechanism by which you can interact with a Chuck script from the outside world. 
All of the hardware interactions that can be used to control a Chuck script are implemented as event subclasses. This includes interacting with your computer keyboard and your mouse, as well as more advanced interactions like using MIDI and Open Sound Control. This is a script from the Chuck Examples folder that I've modified slightly. Up here at the top, we see an object declared with a type of HID. That stands for Human Interface Device, and it's a subclass of event. Next, there's a HID message, which gets used to hold the information that comes out of the HID. Next, we have the syntax for opening the keyboard as a HID device. This will exit the program if the keyboard can't be accessed. Then we have an event loop. The HID object, which is a subclass event, gets chucked into now, which makes the program wait for a HID event. When a hit event signals, this while loop here digs through the hid's receive function. The hid's receive function contains some number of hid messages. So this while loop says, for every message in the receive buffer, copy the message into our hid message. Check to see if that message is a button down message, and if it is, print a logging statement. The logging statement prints the message's which value, its key, and its ASCII code. Okay, let's try this. Chuck event test two dot ck launch it says the keyboard is ready. Now I'm going to hit my A key. It says the code is 30, the USB key is 4, and the ASCII key is 65. I'm going to hit my B key. And so that means my down code is 48, my USB key is 5, and my ASCII key is 66. I'm just going to do A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So as you can see, it's uh, counting up the USB keys and the ASCII keys, and the key codes are sort of jumping around. Uh, not sure exactly what the pattern is for those, but uh, we can see how we can use the USB key and or the ASCII key for musical purposes, which is what we're going to look into next. Okay, so over here... We've got a regular old audio chain here. We've got a sine oscillator going into an ADSR, going into some reverb. Set some default values for that. And now I'm setting up the HID keyboard the way that I did in our previous example. Now I've got a function that plays a little beep from the sine oscillator. It just kicks that envelope and then turns it back off after 100 milliseconds. And now we've got our event loop down here. It's the same one as in the previous example. We chuck the hit event into now and it's going to wait for a hit event and then it's going to take that message and if the message is a button down then it's going to call this function up here i'm going to do it in the on the fly mode because it has a hard time stopping after this and i'm not sure exactly why that is but also it'll, it'll help to illustrate what's happening so chuck dash dash loop that puts it into on the fly mode i'll go over this other terminal chuck event three now it says that oh drat let me get out of here i wanted to add that chuck plus event three that adds that over here okay and now if i hit my a key Something happened. I'm trying to remember my alphabet here. <laughs> What's the Q? Uh, how do I kill it? I gotta, yeah, chuck dash dash kill to kill the other process. Boom. So, as we can see from that example, using events, we can control a Chuck script that is already running. As an exercise, I challenge you, the viewer, to use your keyboard's ASCII code to choose between the samples for the drum machine tutorial. That will illustrate how you could use your keyboard to make all kinds of runtime decisions. As I mentioned a couple of minutes ago, MIDI is also implemented in Chuck as an event subclass, but using it requires a bit of a deep dive into the MIDI protocol, so I'm going to reserve that for another video. In this video, we talked about events, which allow you to ask your programs to wait for something to happen and let you control your programs in real time. 
In the next video, we'll look at how MIDI events let you control your Chuck scripts using a MIDI keyboard, and also let you control outboard MIDI hardware from your Chuck scripts.